Welcome and thank you very much for attending our information evening on county lines and knife crime. Um, we, we feel um, at, at the college that this is a really important uh, topic and obviously you do too. Um, and uh, our students have already seen pretty much the presentation that you'll see tonight, but this has been um, tailored specifically towards parents. So and how you can support students um, and, and understand the, the subject. Um, and so you've already, uh, Emily's already said hello. Um, we're really lucky to have Emily with us once again. Emily's presented to us before in college, as, as I've just said. Um, and um, yeah, so we're just really lucky that she's, she's able to join us this evening. So um, I'll hand you over to Emily, but just to say also, um, we do have um, in the call with us this evening, um, some other members of staff um, from our safeguarding team, um, and our parent liaison officer. Um, so if you've got any questions after the event, we'll be putting around a, a survey afterwards, but if you do have questions, just let us know and we can make sure that they get to the right people for you. So thank you, welcome Emily. Brilliant, thank you very much, Karen. And uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I think if uh, anyone else joins us, I'll just, uh, I'll just let them in. Um, and we can uh, go from there. First of all, I'm going to share my screen with you just so you can see my presentation. Uh, if anyone has any issues and can't fully see it, please let me know. Um, there's some things you can do to, to make Zoom work. Um, yes, so my name is Emily and I am from Fearless and Fearless is the youth service of the charity Crime Stoppers. I'm going to ask you uh, and tell you a little bit about Crime Stoppers first of all before we launch into County Lines what County Lines is. Um, sorry, computer went a bit funny. Um, so yes, today's session should last about an hour. And if you have any questions throughout the whole uh, presentation, please type them in the chat and I'll get to them um, uh, as and when, if that's all right. Brilliant. So as I said, today we're going to cover Crime Stoppers and Fearless and our anonymous crime reporting service, how it works and how you and your young people can use it. We're going to have a look at what County Lines is and how young people are affected and what signs you can spot and where you can go for further help. Touch a little bit on knife crime and drugs involved with County Lines. And then we've got some kind of a on the advice, prevention and tips at the end. And then I'll hang around for a bit if you've got any questions. But I have a question for you. My first thing to say is, what do you know about Crime Stoppers? So on, on your screen, there are a selection of different words and phrases. And I'd like you to put in the chat the words you think accurately describe what Crime Stoppers is. Five of them are correct. So which of these words accurately describe Crime Stoppers? You can, if you can access the chat function, it should be on, uh, on your menu at the bottom. Oh, brilliant, Maria's already in there with confidential. I'm gonna tell you actually that I wouldn't say confidential is correct because there's another word on there that uh, is, is even better than confidential. If you can uh, pick that one out. Oh, police, no, we are nothing to do with the police. We work very closely with the police, but we are not the police and we, uh, we, we are an independent charity. And Tony's got it, yes. Anonymous, that is fun. that is the uh, that trumps confidentiality in my opinion. We can guarantee anonymity. No one will know who you are. Whereas if you say you're confidential, there's still that option that you could potentially be found out for who you are. And Rachel, yes, charity as well. I may have said it a fair few times and given the game away, but we are an independent charity as well. How many is that? You've got anonymous, you've got charity. We need uh, three more, I think, what else? Yes, the phone number, Debbie, thank you very much. 0800 555 is the Crime Stoppers phone number. Uh, so there's two more. 24-7, thank you, Maria. We operate 24-7, 365 days a week. You can call us or submit a form online uh, at any time, um, any time of the day or night. And then there's one more.
Oh, no, we are not the TV programme, Maria. You may be thinking of Crime Watch. Lots of people do. And I always say if we did have a TV programme, I would make sure I was on it. But we, we're not the TV programme, but our number does come up on Crime Watch. And I think in the 80s, there was some sort of affiliated TV programme. Debbie, victim support. Now, that's a really interesting one. That isn't something that Crime Stoppers is. And I'll tell you about that on the next slide. If you need a little bit of help, it's uh, one of the ones down at the bottom. You've already got one of the ones down at the bottom. Which one is the other one? Hey, Tony's got it. Well done, Tony. Rewards, indeed. You may have heard or know that Crime Stoppers offers rewards in certain cases for information to do with certain types of crimes. So well done, guys. Um, this is what Crime Stoppers is. Crime Stoppers is a 24-7 anonymous crime reporting service. We are an independent charity that sometimes can offer rewards. We also do a variety of campaigning uh, and local and regional work as well. Things we're not, we're not associated or run by the police or the government or the any other, um, the Home Office or anything like that. We are, as I said, thousands of times an independent charity and what that means is that we can guarantee that anonymity we don't keep information but we are not beholden to any of these organizations who may want that information um, we work very closely with them of course because we do all want to stop and you know stop crime together um, but we are independent from them we're not the tv program covered that one we're not neighborhood watch we work very closely with them but we're not part of Neighbourhood Watch either. As I said, anonymity trumps confidentiality, in my opinion. The police can get can guarantee confidentiality, but in extreme circumstances, even if you wish to remain anonymous with the police in direct co contact with them, they can trace and find out who you are. Whereas through our service, there is absolutely no way. And victim support. Victim support is a really key thing about Crime Stoppers. Because our system is anonymous, there is no way that uh, anyone can find out who you are. And we're not, uh, we can't pass on your details. We, we don't have them. Um, if you are a victim of crime and you use our service and you say, okay, my name is so-and-so and this happened to me. If we were to pass that information on, we would be revealing your identity, which is something, unfortunately, we can't do. We'd love to, but it, it just wouldn't work. We can't do it. Only in extreme, you know, threat to life circumstances do we have very strict protocols in place. So what we do have for victims of crime is a lot of signposting on our website, lots of places to go for help uh, and support, especially if you were to ring the number. Our call at staff agents are highly trained and will give you um, signpost you to the right places. But what we are primarily for is people that have witnessed crime, they've seen it or they have information about crime and they want to pass that on without revealing who they are. Every year we receive thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of reports from, from the public. And I'll show you some statistics right at the end, but this just shows you here the impact that the information we receive through our system really does have. On average, 10 people a day are arrested because of the information passed through Crime Stoppers service. So you might also be thinking, so, you know, if you, you can report crimes to the police, why do we need Crime Stoppers? Well, there are lots of reasons why people choose to report crimes anonymously. One of the biggest ones reported to us is they don't want to speak to the police for whatever reason that might be. Um, for example, they might be involved in something themselves and they might think, you know, I need to do the right thing. I need to pass this on, but I don't want anyone to, I don't want it to trace back to me. I don't want to be involved with the police. And that's the, another biggest point is they don't want anything traced back to them. A lot of people say they don't want to give their own details. They don't want their name associated with the information they're giving. They might not be prepared to go to court and be involved in that whole process. Um, and the other biggest reason is that fear of repercussions, that something will happen to them if people find out that they reported it. Whether it be that, you know, you reported something to do with your neighbour and that might sour your, your relationship, or it could be a friend or a family member. And, you, you know, you're struggling with that sense of loyalty versus, you know, doing the right thing. Or you might feel threatened that, you know, someone said to you, if you report this, if I find out it's you, I'm going to come and, you know, hurt you then this gives people a safe avenue to do the right thing, report that information without anyone knowing that it was them. 
Crime Stoppers is aimed at the general public and mainly the adult population. And what we found is that there was a need for this sort of service amongst young people. And so about 11 years ago, Crime Stoppers created Fearless. And Fearless is their youth service. So we are exactly the same as Crime Stoppers. We offer exactly the same service, but we are branded for 11 to 18 year olds. Because statistically, young people experience and witness the most amounts of crime, but they are the least likely demographic to actually report it. So young people know what's going on on the streets, they have a lot of information, but we don't get that intelligence and we can't help them with what they're, with what they're going through because they're less likely to tell us for lots of different reasons. And so therefore we feel that there's a real place for our anonymous service um, to make young people aware that this is a way that they can safely pass on information. So how does this service work? This is applies to the Crime Stoppers service as well as the Fearless service. They are essentially the same mechanism just presented in a different way. Every time you give information to Crime Stoppers, we don't ask for any personal details. It's not on any of the online forms. So there's an online form on the Crime Stoppers website as well. Or if you were to ring up, we wouldn't ask you for personal information. If you were to give it to us accidentally, or you said, oh, hello, my name's so-and-so and I'd like to report this. Any information you do give us is securely uh, destroyed and is not kept and we don't keep or record any personal details you might give us. If you were to ring up via the 0800 555 one number, um, your phone number is, um, is scrambled. There's no 1471 kind of redial function that your number doesn't pop up. Um, Crime Stoppers won't appear on your bill the only thing you might have to do is delete it from your calls, your call history on your phone. Um, but there is no way we know or can record or detect that phone phone call. Similarly, if you were to access our service uh, online and fill in either the form on Crime Stoppers or on Fearless.org, your IP address, which is your little digital footprint, every device that connects to the internet has leaves a little digital footprint wherever you go and through that you can be traced back to who you are and what device it is. Every time you press submit on our forms that IP address is scrambled all over servers across the world and so no one can come in hack our systems and find out who you are or what information you gave. There is absolutely no way anyone can find out who you are or what information you have given. The only way that, that, that anyone would know is if you turned to your mate and you said Oh, I reported that on Fearless, if you tell anyone. And as I mentioned earlier, we're an independent charity. We're not beholden to anyone. And we have had requests from, you know, the police saying, oh, you know, we received this piece of intelligence and this piece of intelligence is really, really good. But this person obviously knows more about it. So you need to tell us who this is so we can go and chat to them. And we said, hang on a minute, we, we don't know who this is. So sorry, guys. Um, and they actually took us to court and they said, well, you need to tell us. And we stood up in court and we said, hang on a minute, one, we don't have this information, we don't store it, we don't keep it, so we can't give it to you. Two, even if we did, we wouldn't give it to you anyway. And we won that court case. And so you can be 100% sure that our service will never reveal who you are. In terms of how you go about using our service, there's information obviously on the Crime Stoppers website and the Crime Stoppers number, but for young people and your young people, this is what the form looks like on fearless.org, the website. It's heavily prompted. There's lots of um, extra bits on the page advising them how to fill it in um, and where to go, um, where to get the information and stuff like that. Uh, and each of these boxes, some of these drop down um, and you put your information in there. I always say as a little tip to uh, any young person who might be feeling who might want to fill this in that to put their detective caps on and imagine they're in CSI and try and put all the information in this form that they can. So that is, you know, names, addresses, locations, time, date, anything you think is useful because it's anonymous. We can't go back and ask you extra questions if you forget something. You can fill in another form, but the worst thing we get is if we just have a report that says Jack has a knife at school. Now, we don't know who Jack is. We don't know whether this school's in, in Hampshire or Scotland. We don't know. So we, we can't do anything about it. And that person's been really brave giving that information. But what they need to do is make sure it's as useful as possible. So I say if you don't know where it is or you know it was on the high street or you know uh, that it was 
and you know where it is, but you don't know the address, give it a quick Google, try and find a postcode. If it happens in a school, put the school, try and put where the school is. And if you know what class that kid is in that you might be reporting, try and put the class number. Anything that will help the police narrow it down and use that information, including um, social media sites and people's, uh, people's names and hashtags and handles. Um, you can pop all of that in this form. We also have other safeguards on our website to protect the users um, from kind of uh, revealing that they're using this site. So, for example, you could be in a public place or you could even be in your bedroom and you're filling in this form and someone comes in the door behind you and you don't want them to see you're filling it in. There's a little button at the side of our, all of our website and it says hide your visit and you would press this button. And it takes your screen straight back to Google. So this person who's coming in, you can then just pretend you're Googling cute puppies or something and uh, until they go away and press the back button and it will take you back to the report that you were filling in. So that we try in everything we do to protect the identity and the safety of our users, because it can be quite a, a delicate thing to, 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 to report crime, um, especially for, for a lot of young people. So what happens when you submit that form? So, for example, you are writing a form and you might say, my neighbour at number three is uh, dealing drugs. Uh, you fill all that in with all the relevant details and you press that send button. Your IP address is scrambled and it comes all the way through to our contact centre. Now, our contact centre operates 24-7, so these reports come in um, and they will take a look at it and they will sanitise the whole report. So they will take out anything that relates it to you. So in that report, my neighbour at number three is dealing drugs. You may have not realised that you accidentally told us where you live because you must live next door to number three. Um, and so what we do is we take that information out. So that sanitised report will now read suspected drug dealer at number three. That report is then zipped up and sent off to the local police force uh, to use as intelligence. And that will come through the intelligence department to be assessed and then disseminated out to the relevant police officers uh, dealing with either dealing with the case, add it to an investigation, or it might springboard a new investigation. We like to think as, of the pieces of information we get as little jigsaw pieces that end up filling into a huge big puzzle and finding uh, and helping complete investigations. Um, one thing to note, though, is that because of this process, it isn't an emergency service. So if someone is in immediate danger, we do discourage them from using our service and ask them just to ring 999. Because although we're 24-7, the reports come through um, almost instantaneously, someone at our end at the contact centre still has to ring up, uh, ring up the police and try and organise it that way. So it's not going to be as quick as if you were to ring it, ring it up yourself. We can take information on any type of crime apart from some of the following bits, which are, are very minor. So any crime from, um, you know, uh, drug dealing to uh, human trafficking, all sorts of information uh, we can take. However, we can't take information on emergencies, as I've just said, and also if you are the victim of crime, uh, as I mentioned earlier. A couple of other things we can't take information on is missing people, untaxed vehicles, minor driving offences, dumped vehicles, scam emails or phone calls, noise complaints, benefit fraud or fly tipping. If you wish to report those either to Crime Stoppers or Fearless, then we would recommend uh, on our website, there's signposts and links to places where you can report this uh, and other places. Um, usually the council is the best place to go for most of those things. But anything else, you can go through our service. So, if you wanted to um, refer this service to your young person, you say maybe you've seen this tonight and you think, oh, I think they really need to know about it, then there's just a couple of things uh, you need to tell them. One, that it's anonymous and it really is anonymous. Two, that we are independent. We are not part of the police or the government, that we're not an emergency service. We're not a victim service. We also offer a translation service. So if you would rather fill in the service survey, no, fill in the form, uh, in a different language, then we're able to translate that into over 300 different languages. And then give them a quick overview of what information they need to put in. Remember to tell them to put on their detective caps and try and get that postcode, try and get that all those the, the names and the details, because that's what's going to make their information useful. 
that is just the beginning bit on what fearless is. Does anyone have any questions before we move on and I cover county lines? If you do, uh, as I'm ongoing, do um, just pop them in the chat and I will get to them. It's, uh, it's a little bit difficult virtually to see if anyone's typing or anything like that. So um, do bear with. Thank you, Tony. That's, uh, that's good to hear. Brilliant. Um, so what you're all here for really is a little bit of information about county lines. So I'm not sure how much you know about county lines, but I have yet again another question for you. There are three items on the screen. What are they and how are they linked to crime? or county lines, which is what we're going to be talking about. What do you think? Any keen bird watchers amongst you who recognise the, uh, the bird in the middle? Ah, oh, there we go. Thank you, Rachel. Cuckooing. Definitely, this is a cuckoo. Cuckoo is a very pesky bird. It likes to steal other birds' nests. And uh, because of that, a process that uh, drug dealers use um, is called cuckooing. And I'll cover cuckooing later. So listen out and watch out for the bird. Any idea on what the, uh, the Kinder Egg and the Vaseline are doing? I'll only give you a couple of seconds because uh, I've got a lot to get through. And if you haven't noticed, I do waffle sometimes. So uh, um, I don't want to keep you any longer on this glorious day than I need to. OK, I'll give you a clue. So the Kinder Egg, um, most people say it's illegal in America. Yes, they are. Um, but actually what we're after with the Kinder Egg is the yellow bit in the middle, the little container. And quite often this little container is used to conceal drugs. Uh, to, to put the drugs inside it and close the container um, and I hope that you you know you've uh, not had your, 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 your uh, evening meal yet but the Vaseline um, is also used in conjunction with the little plastic bit in the Kinder Egg um, to help insert it inside the body. This is known as plugging and this is something that's really common when we're looking at drug running, moving drugs from place to place. I've been told by numerous police officers that quite often they're finding young people using this Kinder Egg method uh, to put, hide the drugs inside themselves and move it from place to place. And so essentially that's what we're talking about today when we look at county lines. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of what it is, so we're gonna go through a brief introduction, then we're gonna have a look at uh, how it affects young people, how young people might be groomed into uh, this drug running uh, gang culture. Uh, and then we're going to have a, a look at what can be done about that at the end. So what county lines is, it's not a very descriptive term, but what it does mean is it's a pro the process of effectively gangs moving drugs from one place to another to sell in that new area. And these usually cross county lines. That's why, it, why it's called county lines. And if we're looking at our, our local area, apologies, I've got Surrey up on there. I usually do most of this stuff in Surrey, but we've got London up here. Most of these drug dealing gangs that come from big urban cities, whether it be London or Manchester, it's got to the point where there are just too many of them. They're oversaturated and they can't expand their business model to make more money. And so what they're doing is they're expanding outwards into the rural areas, into the coastal areas to set up and overtake new drug, uh, overtake drug markets uh, and make more profit by taking over new areas. Um, and so they're coming, you know, from uh, London and uh, all of the other urban areas into and through Hampshire and Surrey to do that. Now the term county lines actually refers to the mobile phone line used to control this uh, expansion. So everything um, is controlled through the use of burner phones or you know the, the cheap sim cards, uh, pay as you go sim cards, um, that is the way that the communication and the logistics uh, is run. And it kind of works a little bit like this. So you have your gang uh, at their HQ, let's say London as an example, uh, and they've got quite a lucrative business going because at the end of the day, this is a business model, really. Um, and they're, they're, they want to expand and make more money. And now it's, it's important to note as well, though, to be fair, that this isn't really new. 
this expansion and smuggling of drugs isn't really a new thing, but there are definite new and worrying things about what the gangs are doing and how they're doing it. And it's mainly about how they're willing to use uh, vulnerable people, young people, and exploit them just in order to make more money, which is it's a newer development. So the gangs in their HQ, they want to expand. They're going to send a lower level, level, lower level member of their gang out into the countryside to have a look around, see where's a good place to expand our market to. And this is known as going country or going country, going OT, out there, out trapping. There's lots of different names for it. And it's usually undertaken by young people groomed into gangs in, in urban areas and sent on trains to go out into uh, new areas. But we're not going to focus on that side of it today. We're going to focus on what happens when they reach the rural area, which Farnborough, Surrey, Hampshire, we are mainly the receiving the imported gangs. So when they get to that local area, they're going to try and check it out, set, see if they can set up in that area. What they want to look for is what's the police presence like? What's the drug market like? Are there really strong uh, gangs here already? Um, is it worth trying to take over? Are they weak? Can we try and take over? They might try and make a deal with a local gang. They might um, try and uh, violently take over. So that sometimes you might see that incursion of violence coming down from London as these gangs start clashing with each other over territory. Um, and then they're going to see uh, if they've got any customers, any drug users that are going to buy the product that they're trying to sell. They'll then try and come in and undercut the market by selling everything at reduced costs, trying special offers and special deals to try and make try and get that market um, from the other uh, existing local gangs uh, and try and develop it that way. And this is where uh, this is what has several effects on the local area, not just kind of the, the increase in violence potentially in this uh, disruption, but they're going to need somewhere to stay. So they can send people up and down on trains and use cars all they like, but they need access to that 24 seven market, especially the nighttime economy where they sell most of their drugs. And so they need somewhere permanent to stay. And this is where that bird comes back. Cuckooing, the term cuckooing, as I said earlier, the cuckoo steals other birds' nests. These gangs, they steal people's homes. They target vulnerable individuals uh, and they either charm their way into their lives or they threaten their way into them. And they slowly uh, take over that individual's property for use as a drug den or a trap house, somewhere to store uh, and that store their drugs, their weapons, their money and to deal them from. There's um, this is this can happen in 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 more uh, built up areas, but it also can happen in more rural areas. And it's important to keep an eye out in your area for individuals um, that you think might be slightly vulnerable in your in your um, in your area um, to to spot the signs of cuckooing, because it's not just the case that they just you know let them in and everything's fine. They just pop in for a cup of tea and do a couple of drug deals. They are really insidious about the ways and methods that they control these individuals. There have been some really, you know, disturbing uh, accounts of um, the police raiding properties and finding the owner sleeping on dog beds in a, a dog bed in the kitchen because that's the only place he was allowed to sleep. They'll take your food, they'll take your money, they'll take your electricity and their and your water, and they'll just leave you. Um, it's uh, it's really terrible. I could go on about it for ages and I will, um, if you're interested, uh, I can send through a little article that explains a little bit more about it afterwards, uh, but I do have to move on. But in terms of what you guys can spot in your area, um, have a look if you know there's vulnerable people or if there are houses that have experienced changes. Maybe there's an increase in people entering and leaving, especially at the moment when we're all in lockdown, it's easier to spot these properties. Um, and there are people you don't recognise coming. Maybe there are cars and bikes coming and stopping uh, for a short period of time and then leaving again. Or there's lots of bikes piled up outside. An increase in antisocial behaviour, perhaps there's a lot more um, noise coming from the property, a lot more rubbish perhaps outside or signs of drug use. Maybe you can smell cannabis um, or there's uh, little 
uh, little plastic baggies outside or um, in certain cases you might see kind of dropped needles outside of a property. Usually the houses look like they're in a bit of a state of disrepair as they're not being kept up uh, due to the owner not being in a state of control over the property. Um, you might notice a lack of healthcare visitors if they were once regular they're not coming anymore or if people knock on the door um, the owner doesn't answer it um, or um, if they do they, they, they don't go outside they don't let people in. There is a long list you can have a google of it and I'll send you some more information but it's definitely something to be on the lookout for. Now the second important aspect of county lines is how it affects uh, predict, pre predominantly young people but uh, affects people in their new area because not only do they need somewhere to stay they're going to need people to run the drugs for them they're going to need local drug dealers these people are going to know the area they're going to be uh, able to uh, move around they're not going to have to take that risk of moving people up and down from London for example so they need to go and recruit a new army of drug dealers and also you have to bear in mind that this is about making money and they want to make as much money as possible. And so therefore they want to get the cheapest, the, uh, the cheapest drug dealers that they can get. They effectively, they don't even want to pay them. They want free slave labor. And that's the, 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 the aim of these gangs. So in terms of recruiting and grooming individuals into this, there is no one particular category of people uh, that they will, um, they'll go for from from evidence uh, individuals and young people from a variety of different backgrounds have been involved and been groomed into drug dealing in county lines um, from um, you know what might one might consider a, 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 the usual stereotype of you know a, a drug user a drug addict to um, someone from a very affluent home who goes to a private school it's county lines doesn't have like boundaries on victims um, but there are some that are, are more susceptible to being targeted, um, and that would be, you know, drug users already with connections to drug dealers, um, uh, vulnerable individuals with welfare needs, uh, young women, uh, single mothers, they usually target those, um, and also young people. Uh, and young people bring them a lot of advantages that, that aren't afforded to uh, the rest of the population, such as uh, the ability to kind of move around undetected, the fact they don't have to pay them so much. Even the law works in their favour in terms of if a young person gets caught with knives or a drug and drugs and they're not uh, they're not of an age uh, where they will be put in custody and sent to prison. Likelihood is they'll be out on the streets the next day. And so they know that they can just keep using them over and over again. And so there's a recognised four stage process to um, trying to find what the bond notes. Recognised four stage process to recruiting uh, a a new drug dealer, shall we say? But effectively, it's grooming. It's a form of um, form of exploitation, um, and they do this in a variety of ways. So the first stage is where they will target an individual, and I'll go into this a little bit later. Um, but they're going to try and find uh, find who they're looking for, introduce them to uh, the lifestyle a little bit um, and really uh, find that individual that they want to bring into the fold. Then they're going to test them uh, and so they're going to test their metal, see if they've got what it takes to be part of it, they might um, introduce them to the lifestyle a little bit, they, the young person or the individual might become, um, might start dealing drugs. Um, I always say there are kind of two forks that this goes off of with, that leads to an individual becoming involved in county lines gangs. The first one is they are um, they are unsuspecting, innocent, and they've been groomed into it. So these people have approached them, they've charmed them, they've pretended uh, to be someone they're not, they've given them gifts, they've made them feel uh, wanted, um, and that this young person's not really aware that they're becoming involved with criminals. Then there's the second prong where the young person is aware that these people do deal drugs uh, and for whatever reason might be interested uh, either to, to get a little bit of money, to get a little bit of uh, street cred, um, to get some thrills. They might kind of actively want to be involved. 
but because they're under the age of uh, kind of 18, they they will still both be liable to being groomed in this process. And so at that testing stage, uh, the unsuspecting person will then be asked to do sort of favours for the gang. Um, they won't really know what they're doing, but there's someone will say, oh, God, look, my mates let me down. Can you take this package uh, and uh, keep it in your drawer for a week and I'll come back and uh, I'll take the package and we'll go for a great party. I'll give you loads of money for it. That, that'd be great. Um, or the other way uh, for the individual that knows this is a drug dealing operation, it might be more of an initiation, like you have to prove yourself to be part of this uh, and they'll start setting them kind of those uh, missions, as it were, of, of drug dealing and having to make a certain amount of money, X, Y and Z. After a while, you get to the hooked stage. Now, the hook stage is effectively like the honeymoon period. It's the stage where young people feel they're still in control of what they're doing. They may have made the decision. They feel like they've made the decision. They feel like they are making more money. They feel that they're um, they're becoming more popular, uh, that they've becoming well known in the gang. And um, they've got uh, a good access to, to money, to drugs. They might be getting new clothes and new new trainers and they might have a sense of belonging as well this might start feeling like you know family people they can rely on um, but they might also at the same time becoming more active in criminal activity you might um, they might be staying out and go, uh, staying out later and maybe missing school or not going to clubs that they used to because the drug dealing and the gang activity has kind of overtaken that um, and they might also at this stage beginning to feel a little bit unsafe because their name might be known, they might be known to other gangs or have internal conflicts within their gang. Uh, so they might be avoiding, you know, going to certain places or talking to certain people and feeling a bit, um, feeling like they, they're in danger. But this isn't where the gangs want them. They're still paying them. They're still being, there's still effort and they want to trap them. They want cheap reusable slave labour and so what they do at this stage is when that whole process turns completely negative where once they may have been your best friend your father figure the person that looks out for you on the corner or the person that gets you gifts or the you know the person you look up to as a role model when they were that they are now the complete opposite they will start turning against this person, humiliating them, belittling them, perhaps threatening them or even assaulting them. Um, they will then, like a manipulator, turns on uh, his victim, will try and ensnare and trap that young person into drug dealing. Uh, but of course, they don't want to pay them. So they're going to use tactics to make sure that they don't have to pay them. And one of those ways is by getting a person into something called a drug debt. And what a drug debt is, is effectively you have an individual who is going and dealing some drugs and either on their way or coming back, they'll be mugged or robbed uh, and the drugs or the money is taken from them. The person will come back to the gang and say, oh God, look, I'm really sorry this has happened to me. Um, I, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm really sorry. And the gang will then say, OK, but that's your fault. That's your fault you got robbed. It's your fault you lost this money. You now owe us that money and it could be 200, 500,000 pounds, whatever they the gang think, because that person has been robbed by the gang or affiliate members of the gang. They arranged it. They organised it. The gang has lost nothing. But the young person feels like they owe them this money and put yourself in the young person's shoes. Even if you did think you were even if you felt in control of this, these choices, you were not aware this was going to happen. And you now owe large sums of money, which you're not going to have in your bank account. You're unlikely to go and tell someone or ask them for it. You definitely can't go to the police and say, uh, I was robbed, but I was robbed of some drugs that I was carrying. Um, so what is a young person going to do? Well, the gang then hands them a lifeline. They say, hey, we know it wasn't your fault. We know you didn't mean it, but we still need that money. So what you can do is you can work for us until you pay off that debt. And the young person might think, OK, this is my only chance. This is the way I can do it. How are they going to make them pay off that debt? Well, first of all, they're going to make them deal drugs for them for free whenever. So at this stage, a young person is glued to that burner phone, the only way of contacting them. And every time that goes off, they have to be out and they have to make that drug deal. 
they are working 24 seven. At this point, they're probably so worried about the, the consequences of not working, not paying back this deal, that they're gonna be missing school. They're gonna be staying away from home at large periods of time. They're not gonna be talking to their old friends anymore. They're gonna be very anxious, maybe even malnourished because they don't have time to eat if they're constantly working, constantly worrying. So working drug dealing is one way. Um, another way is they might force them uh, to perform uh, sexual acts on individuals for money. Obviously the money goes to the gang. Um, also in that process, it's quite common for, for that to be filmed. Uh, and that video footage will then later be used as further blackmail to make sure that that young person stays under their control. Um, sorry, I forgot I had a special slide for this. Um, and the other way is they could ask someone to um, perform uh, violent acts on someone. So you go and stab this guy and we'll be even. One of the ways the gang keeps their hands clean in any details and any, do, any dirty work um, while getting the, the young people to take the fall for it. So that drug debt is very, very common actually as a way of um, trapping young people into it. Um, and let's say also the, the young person's got to this stage and they realise, hang on a minute, this is not what I got myself into. This is not what I want. I want to leave. I want to get out. What, what can they do? Well, there's not just the drug debt that's trapping them in this. There's a lot of other reasons why it's difficult for them to get out of this stage. One, during this process, they might have started taking drugs or taking harder drugs and they might have developed an addiction. And so therefore, rationally, they think easiest and best way for me to continue uh, access to these drugs is to stay within the gang. They might have blackmail hanging over them, either of those sexual acts or criminal acts they might have done. And threats to, to reveal that to a family or to the police, keep them in the gang. The fear of the gang themselves, they know full, full well either from uh, witnessing or hearing um, about the, the threats and acts that these gangs are willing to, to do. That's another thing about these gangs is that they, they are more willing to use violence than they were in the past and, and the young people know this. And they're also more willing to threaten family members and uh, friends, um, they, they don't have morals. The young person might have missed a lot of school, might not have uh, qualifications and might feel that they don't have any more opportunities, that they're not going to be able to get a job earning the same money. And so for them, best way to provide for themselves and their family, stay in the gang. They might have been moved from their local area. In that process right at the beginning, do you remember that they go from one place and they move somewhere else and set up a new, a new county line? Well, the young person might have been forced to pick up sticks and go and live in some other cuckooed property, some dirty trap den somewhere um, as a way of controlling them, as a way of removing them from their support services, removing them from any social service or police radar they may have been on within one county and moving them somewhere else. There's been cases of kids from the south of England going and being moved to Scotland, for example. So that that is uh, a possibility. But one thing I think is, uh, is the most insidious is um, how they manipulate uh, and use mobile phones. So not just, um, you know, these burner phones, these old, you know, brick phones with the, the throwaway SIM card in, but every young person that I know will have some sort of smartphone. And what's on every smartphone? A GPS tracking system. And so the gangs will somehow in that process either uh, coerce or, or convince the young person to give them access to it or they'll buy them a phone and that will have that on it already. And so the young person will know that the gang know where they are at all times. So maybe they think, hang on a minute then, ditch the phone and leg it uh, and then I'll get away. The gangs already thought of that and they've sent a picture of their parents' front door to their phone. You can run away, but we know what will hurt you. What often starts out for a lot of young people as a quick thrill, access to, to drugs, um, or maybe you know new friends, new um, a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, can quickly turn into, um, into being isolated, scared and in danger in some isolated trap house, seeing things that no child should ever see without the ability to see a way out. It's, um, it's important to note that this is, not, uh, this is not what happens to every single person involved. 
it is the ideal state the gangs want, but it is rare that young people will get to that position, but it is not out of the realms of possibility. Um, there are certainly kids in Hampshire that are in this position, um, but what we need to do is we all need to work together to make sure that no more kids end up in this position. So I'm gonna go through some of the, uh, some of the ways in which um, you, young people are groomed into this, uh, the signs that you can spot and things we can do to prevent young people being in this position. So if we go back on this scale at the bottom, if we go right back to targeting, how are they going to select these individuals um, that are going to uh, be their new slaves? Well, they do this in a variety of ways. First of all, social media. Social media, as I'm sure you know, plays a huge role in young people's lives, as does it play a huge role in the gangs, especially gangs made up of younger people at, that, at the top of the chain. They use social media uh, as any business does to advertise, to merchandise, to market, to recruit. It's a main part of their, their, their running system. And this is also how they're gonna target, uh, one way that they can target people. I often say to young people, where you can keep yourself safe is by making sure your social media is private and also looking at what you're posting on social media. For example, you can learn a lot about someone just from scrolling through their Instagram. Even if you think it's innocent, you can learn what part of the country they live in, what music they like, what, what gifts would be nice to give them, um, who their family and friends are. Um, you know, Even if it's just an innocent picture, maybe with your friends in your front garden, do you have the, the door number of your house in the background or a selfie with your mum? Oh, we know who your mum is now. We know who we can track down if you're not doing what you're told. It's surprising how they will utilise it. And so I do definitely encourage people to really reevaluate what they put publicly on social media. Peer groups is another way. So through friends of friends, effectively. So uh, these out of town dealers will, will uh, come in and um, get contacts within the community. And what often happens is they'll put pressure on existing drug dealers in the area to then recruit more. So um, Connections can be made through um, ex-students, um, you know, bro older brothers and older sisters, um, friends of friends or people they meet down at the park. You know, the, the typical kind of, you know, stranger danger stuff um, is, is just a, a way that they will target and approach people. A little bit less common is direct approaches. Um, so I've had, you know, numerous young people tell me that they've someone's just come up to them in the street and said, oh, do you want to sell some weed for me? Or someone's hung out of a car window and said, oh, do you want to earn some money? Um, that's less common, but it does happen. I mean, these gangs have also been known to hang outside uh, schools for closing time, especially after school detention as well. So they see the sort of kids that come out and they think, right, they're the ones we should go for. They also tend to target individuals that they think are more vulnerable. Um, so they are very insidious and they will target um, children's homes because they assume kids are gonna be easier to manipulate from those environments. Um, but on the, same, on the same, uh, same point, not only will they target them uh, if they think they're vulnerable, um, but also in terms of, um, Oh no, I just forgot what it was. Um, clean skins. I don't know if you've heard that term before, clean skins. What it means is an individual without a criminal record or being known to uh, any social services or anything like that. So they will also target individuals that are not on any, uh, any safeguarding radar they're not known to the police they're not known to social services because they think it will take longer for anyone to notice and detect uh, any changes in that young person because they're not being they don't have such close scrutiny on them so there's a variety of, of, of ways that the reasons they approach different people but I think the main way that they will recruit young people is through an existing connection with a drug dealer so most young people will know someone who takes drugs and most young people will know 
either through a friend or a friend of a friend who can get them drugs or deals drugs. Um, there is, um, is really, really common amongst young people um, to, to have that information. Um, and it is through those channels that the gangs will put pressure, they'll probably blackmail um, those lower level drug dealers uh, and say, hang on a minute, you need to recruit X number of people for us, otherwise, you know, something bad's going to happen to you. Um, so that is uh, another way, having those connections with those dealers. How do they do that? They do that in a variety of ways, but the main way is they aim to fill a need. They'll identify something that someone wants or something someone needs, whether that be a monetary thing, so they they need money, maybe they come from a, a, a not so well off background, maybe they uh, want better trainers or they want uh, they want money to spend. Maybe it's a more relationship need. Maybe they don't get on so well with their family or they're not doing too well in school and they want a role model or a father figure and they'll be that to them. Or it could just be that they want drugs and the gang can offer them free and cheap drugs. Uh, usually it's trying to fill that need, give them something they want to hook them in uh, and to, to get them involved in the first place. So what happens um, with young people who are involved in county lines what inf what is uh what is the response nationally so the first kind of step is getting out of county lines so we went back to that trapped individual and that story of them um effectively not find not knowing a way to to leave and get out of county lines um, and I am not going to sit here and tell you that there's an easy way to get out of these gangs. As I said, there's a number of reasons why they stay in them. It is very difficult, but there is a lot of movement uh, in this direction, um, trying to find ways to support and get young people out of these gangs. Um, for example, um, there's a lot of uh, support from charities and uh, the police um, for these essentially victims. Um, because they've been through this recognised grooming process, they are victims of exploitation, victims of grooming, and therefore they can also be recognised as such in the eyes of the law. So there's something called a Section 45 defence. Um, and if you can prove that a young person has been a victim, um, then they will be treated as such uh, in the eyes of the law. Um, there's lots of diversionary tactics. I've got an, another slide with some bits and bobs on about that. Um, but it is incredibly difficult to get uh, a young person to, to, to get out of the, the service, but there is a lot of stuff that um, is being done uh, to help them, including um, movements within legislation and government and the justice system in terms of tackling county lines at the source. So these the little drug dealers that are having the worst time facing the highest risk, they are more common. Um, more common to get caught, they're more likely to get caught, uh, but they don't have enough information. Catching one of them is not going to close a county line. They need to get the big fish right at the top. Um, I realise I'm really dark, by the way, um, sitting in a light room. Um, they need to catch the big fish at the top of that, the top of the chain. And in order to do that, there's a lot of work that's going on, lots of joint working between different police forces. They're using the Modern Slavery Act, so they're getting them under, uh, under legislation, which is going to put them away for a lot longer than drug legislation. Um, there's doing a lot of work disrupting lines within prisons and Ofsted are doing some work as well with the police about schools and school exclusions. And there's a lot of work that's going on to disrupt those uh, the elders that run the gang so that we can stop the, the damage being done at the bottom of the line. But the best thing we can do for our young people at the bottom is to raise awareness, to bring that education to you guys, to teachers and to the young people. So you can spot the signs, you can see it in your peers and in your children, and you can know who to go to uh, for some help and advice. So on that note, what are the signs to spot uh, if you suspect that you're uh, your young person is involved in county lines. I'll send you, um, I'll send Karen a PDF of this to send out if you want a, a whole copy. And obviously the recording will also be available. Um, 
So the first one is that the young person staying out all night, not coming to school or going missing or traveling to areas far away from home for no good reason. They might have train tickets to places that you haven't gone together and you definitely haven't bought it for them. So why are they going there? Who bought it for them? It's very important to keep any of that as well because it might be um, it might be used as evidence. Using drugs or having drugs on them, maybe they never used drugs before but you're starting to recognise it or maybe they did but now they're using a lot of harder drugs or you found larger quantities of drugs. Having multiple phones like these down at the bottom and receiving a lot of unexplained calls or messages. Um, so as soon as the, that phone goes off, they've got to be up and out the door um, because they know the consequences if they don't. They might start carrying weapons. They might start feeling unsafe, especially if uh, they are both fearful of other gangs and also their own gang. So they might start trying to arm themselves. If they're secretive about who they are talking to or where they're going, if they have unexplained money, clothes or jewellery, you know it hasn't been their birthday or Christmas, you haven't bought it for them, they don't have the money for it, where have they got it from? Increasingly disruptive and aggressive behaviour, above and beyond the, the, the normal, whatever that may look like. Um, but if you're a young person, you're going through all of this stuff, you're not going to be the same nice and kind person you were before. Um, so that's something to look out for. Using words you wouldn't expect them to use, so maybe a more aggressive or more sexualized language, maybe a lot more swear words or uh, kind of gang terminology. Um, obviously, if they start sounding like a, a you know a rapper from South London, it doesn't necessarily mean they're an instant criminal. Um, it could just mean they're listening to a lot of Stormzy. But it's definitely any changes in in vocabulary and vernacular is is an indication that they're being influenced by something else. So it's definitely worth having a conversation about. Having injuries or appearing unusually scruffy, it's definitely a red flag. And also if you find hotel cards or keys to unknown places, um, this suggests that they've been moving drugs to other places or staying at these cuckoo properties. And as I said, I'll send you the list of these because I realise uh, I am kind of running over as, uh, so if you bear with me. So preventing county lines, a few tips that I've mentioned um, previously, just going to summarise some here. So I mentioned clean skins, about them to, focusing on young people that are not associated with any statutory body. Uh, a tip that you can give young people is if someone does approach you, someone does ask you, do you want to deal drugs for me or, you know, that sort of thing. Just say, oh, no, guys, look, I can't. I can't come later. The, the social worker's coming around for mum. Or, or something like that can make an excuse that makes you seem untouchable, that, that you're undesirable to them. Uh, which is the same sort of thing as, as approaching. Um, I'm sure there's lots of places you can get more advice on, on how to kind of say no to, to individuals that, that approach you. Social media, as I said, very important that, um, you know, young people realise what they're posting on there and what, what messages they're actually sending to people and what information you can gain. Uh, about you just from what you're posting. Awareness is key in making sure that young people recognise it before it gets to that trapped stage. Um, diversionary activities, making sure young people have hobbies and um, af things after school to do rather than um, rather than just kind of going on the streets or, or talking to, um, spending lots of time kind of talking to random people. I know it's difficult at the moment, but luckily we're coming into the point where things are opening up again um, and young people can be part of different clubs and things like that. Having a discussion with young people, an open and honest one, and I'll, I've got some bits and bobs about that at the end, but there's nothing better than sharing knowledge and having a discussion. Also reporting, don't be afraid to contact someone if you're worried. Um, I've got a list of agencies at the end, um, but the staff at the, the, the college will be there to support you. Um, there are a number of charities that can provide help and advice. Um, and also there is the police and the police are very aware of county lines and how it works. And they will be sympathetic and try and get, give you as much advice as possible. Their main aim is not to necessarily criminalize all of these young people that are being groomed into it, they want to catch the big fish at the top. So they will be there to give you help and advice. Um, and also that might not make any sense, but there's something called the national referral mechanism. And I mentioned the section 45 defense, which labels someone as a victim. 
that is there in, in the case where, you know, you have identified a young person that's been involved um, and this will help safeguard them, uh, this process. But anyone involved in the college or the police will know about this safeguarding system. So any more questions, you can kind of point it to them. In terms of what the picture looks like in, uh, in our area, um, County Lines is operating in Surrey, County Lines is operating in Hampshire, County Lines is operating everywhere. Um, mainly what we're seeing down, down in the south is, is gangs coming in from London and primarily they use train lines to, um, to move into an area. So if an area is on a train line, it's more susceptible to uh, these gangs coming in. Um, but what we've seen during the, the pandemic is that they're more likely now to use cars um, and taxis to ferry people and move drugs. So it's not just places that are on train lines that are affected. We've known lots of rural areas that, um, that have had instances of it too. Um, for our area, main lines are going down, um, for example, straight down south towards Brighton and the coastal areas, um, going through uh, Red Hill and Gatwick, and then off um, off through uh, kind of Aldershot and Farnborough down that M3 down towards Southampton and the Isle of Wight. Um, I know that last year in September the, ga uh, the police managed to do a massive operation where they shut down a massive cultivation plant and got, I can't remember the statistic, but got a lot of money's worth of, closed down a lot of money's worth of um, operations in Southampton um, and obviously kind of Aldershot, Woking, they're on that direct line in and out and they also are towns which would suffer from this themselves. Woking is slightly different because Woking has a really strong homegrown uh, drug dealing network so the gangs from London haven't bothered to try and get any claws in there but if you take somewhere like Dorking in Surrey didn't really have a strong drug dealing community um, and it was easy for gangs to take over and now there is quite a big county lines problem there. And if we look nationally if you imagine uh, well, every red dot on there is a, is a place where these gangs are starting. Every blue dot is where they're going. And it fans out a little bit like this and it spreads like a pandemic. Um, and if you imagine each of those red lines is controlled by one of those phone lines, the county lines phone line, and it's spreading out to anywhere that they think they can make more money. Um, and if you look in our area, there's a, a lot of blue dots and this map's slightly out of date. So I would say there's probably not many places that are untouched by or at least haven't been scouted out by these gangs as, as a place to expand into. In terms of um, in terms of this expansion, as I said, like a pandemic, it's it's growing and it's moving. How has that fared during COVID nineteen? Well, we know that drug dealing has not stopped. County lines has not stopped during COVID nineteen. You can't furlough a drug dealer. These people still need to make money. They still need to you know, defend their territory. And also demand has increased. People have been stuck at home. Where there's demand, there is supply. And we know that therefore drug dealing hasn't stopped. If anything, it may have uh, actually increased. How have they been able to do this? The gangs have developed new tactics to avoid being caught, basically. They've disguised themselves as key workers, especially at the beginning, as nurses, nurses, supermarket drivers. They've uh, ingratiated themselves into community COVID action groups where they've delivered for shopping to people, also carrying their drugs and delivering on them on the way, or collecting a list of all the vulnerable people that they can later exploit. Um, They've been changing their method of uh, delivery, not just meeting on a shady uh, street corner. They've literally been doing door to door drops because, you know, everyone's getting more deliveries now. So putting a high vis on, dropping something through a letterbox, it's not that obvious. Um, and they've also been changing the way that they contact people and advertise, as you can see up here. Uh, here's an advert that says if you buy some uh, cannabis from us we'll give you a free toilet roll back when toilet roll was a very scarce product um, but what this also means especially during the stricter lockdowns is that these guys do stick out a bit like a sore thumb which has meant that the police and the authorities have able to make huge huge gains on identifying lines cracking down on people um, and as you can see here some statistics from a year ago kind of um, but it shows that there was a massive increase in the amount of arrests made for drug dealing. And there was also a 43% increase in 
the positive outcomes from stop and search, for example. Um, so my hope is that as we come out of the pandemic, um, the, the lessons that the, the police and justice system have learned from this period where they've been able to detect them more easily will continue, um, continue on. And there's been some really good work that's been done over the last year. I realise that I am now slightly over. I do have a few more bits and bobs to go to go through if you're interested. I'll try and do them relatively quickly. Um, this is recorded, so if you need to leave, you can go and you can catch up on it um, after uh, when 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 it's up uploaded if uh, if necessary. But I think it is is important, so I'm going to cover what I can. Um, so in terms of uh, knife crime, just just a tiny bit on knife crime, just to make you aware of a few changes in legislation. That's not all I to show you, because um, <laughs> um, obviously uh, county lines is is not immune to to violence, and it's very likely that a young person dealing drugs or involved in this is at some point going to be either asked to carry a knife, forced to carry a knife, or feel like they have to to protect themselves and others. Um, but it is. Uh, is still a, a massive risk and a massive decision. Uh, the possession of a knife carries a potential prison sentence of up to five years, even if it's not used. There is a two strike rule if you get caught carrying a knife a second time, um, but that's a minimum four month sentence in a young offenders prison if you're under 18. Um, protection is not a valid excuse for carrying a knife. Uh, and the minute you even show the knife, even if you don't use it, if you're, for example, threatening someone with it, uh, the charge becomes aggravated, which means that you're likely to get more time in prison or a higher a higher sentence. Also, you're more likely to be stabbed by your own knife, the statistics show. Uh, so um, carrying a knife increases the chance that you'll get hurt or that your own knife will be turned against you. There are so many cases where that has happened. Um, and there are, so I'm sure you're all aware of the consequences of carrying a knife. Um, just to you know, reiterate what I assume is obvious to most people is that it's illegal to sell or buy a knife to uh, anyone who's under 18. Um, and it, this is uh, any knife. And what I'd like to draw some attention to is some new legislation that's just come into force about uh, different types of uh, knives and weapons and offensive weapons which you might not be aware of, such as disguised knives. Um, so new legislation has made it illegal, not only for you to buy some of these items, but also just to keep them at home, to own them at all. Um, it is now uh, completely illegal, for example, to have uh, a hidden knife. So the one at the top here, this is a credit card knife. So it's a, a disguised knife that folds up and can go into a wallet slot. You have lipstick knives, pen knives, all of these things that, you know, you could pick up on holiday as little trinkets or something like that. You might have one in your back drawer somewhere. These are now illegal to own. Um, I can't remember where's the thing. I don't have the ex exact statistics on um, the consequences of owning this, um, but it is. Um, it's now treated uh, under the Offensive Weapons Act. Um, so it's completely illegal to own any of these things, including zombie knives, uh, spiral knives, all of those um, fun sounding things. Um, here also is uh, another image, which I don't know if you can read it, but at the bottom it says feminine weapons for the girly gangster. This is I found on social media. Social media, uh, it's become increasingly common to advertise these uh, these. Uh, comb knives, pen knives, uh, especially to younger audiences and display them as personal protection items. Some young people might not be aware that it is completely illegal to own any of these items, uh, let alone buy them. Um, and especially in wake of um, Sarah Everard and the, the worries that many women will have walking the streets at night, there may be, some people may feel the need to have something to protect themselves, which although understandable, brings a greater risk to yourself. As I said, you're more likely to get into an altercation, you're more likely to be stabbed by your own weapon. Um, and now having any of these, especially even if you're carrying outside, that was illegal before, but even if you've just got it in your home, that is illegal. Same goes for this. This looks like a lovely innocent key ring over here, number three, but that is indeed a knuckle duster. 
and they're being sold uh, on the internet on eBay. Um, so if you know if your kid set, turns up with one of these fancy key rings, it has an ulterior motive. In terms of the drugs you'll see um, in uh, in a county lines uh, operation, you've got your normal ones going along here. Uh, ecstasy, LSD, variety of different pills, cannabis, weed, marijuana. Um, this stuff doesn't make them that much money. I think they'd rather not sell it if they if they didn't have to, because it doesn't really make them, as I said, that much money. But what it does do is it gives them a wider access to an increased market, because there's a lot more people that would buy cannabis than they would buy any other drug. Cocaine and heroin are what make them the most money. It's what uh, most drug dealers will be carrying or being forced to carry. Um, and what you're most likely to see. But they'll also carry a variety of um, black market legal highs or not so legal highs as the case may be. Um, just to draw your attention to two, because I think it's important. Um, the first one is Xanax, which is a benzodiazepine anti-anxiety pill, which is American. It's made in America. Um, it's prescription in America made by, I can't remember, a pharmaceutical company. Um, and it's becoming popular in pop and rap culture in America. I mean, Billie Eilish, she has a song about it. There's a rapper named after it. Um, and especially with the, the state of young people's mental health after this pandemic, some might be seeking um, seeking access to, to this drug. Um, however, it's not available in Britain. We don't make it or import it uh, officially. Um, but we have seen these tablets pop up. The, the nearest thing you can get in Britain is diazepam, which is not as strong as Xanax. But what we've found popping up are fake Xanax pills that have been cooked in someone's basement uh, and they've been made with incredibly dodgy drugs that increase its lethality. And this was only found out, unfortunately, following um, some a spate of deaths up north where individuals have been taking this at the same rate they would expect to take the normal pill and then unfortunately overdose on it. Um, so what we're doing is we're trying to raise a little bit of awareness around um, making sure that young people understand that or anyone understands that just because it has the name stamped on it or they've put it in a little pot that might say its name on it. It's not you don't have a receipt. You don't have the instru the, the ingredients. Um, you don't know what you're taking. Laughing gas, nitrous oxide, the little silver canisters you might have seen strewn across parks and uh, <clears throat> and roads. Um, this is only here because gangs often use that uh, as a way of connecting with more young people because lots of young people who don't tend to use drugs, they might consider using laughing gas as it's seen by young people as being largely a legal drug. Technically it is legal, it's legal for you to buy it, it's legal for you to use it yourself, but it is illegal to sell it or give it to someone with the purpose of them uh, inhaling it as a drug because it is covered under the Psychoactive Substances Act, um, but it is uh, it's 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 on a funny illegal legal boundary. Um, but what these gangs are doing is they're approaching young people and offering them to sell uh, selling these to them as a way of building more connections with young people they may not have had connections with before. On the screen are a few things that might help you identify if uh, your young person or anyone is involved with taking drugs or dealing drugs. So we have a, a, a smorgasbord of different drug paraphernalia, mainly pertaining to uh, marijuana, weed, cannabis, whatever you want to call it. Um, and for most young people, it's probably the, the first drug they will try or get involved with. Um, these little coils of cardboard at the bottom. These are um, roaches, they're filters, like handmade ones. You can buy them pre-made, um, but this is quite often what people are using. They'll tear off the bits from these uh, from these paper packets here. Um, so if you see uh, these Rizzler packets with bits torn off or cigarette packets with bits torn off, it may very well indicate that they're making these little cardboard filters for, um, for uh, weed joints. Um, this is a grinder to grind the herbs down. You can get rolling boxes so they might have got a nice you know wooden little box um, that might actually contain their rolling stuff. 
Um, these little bags, these little cellophane ziplock bags that are very tiny, it's often what the, the drugs are moved and dealt in. These are pipes that you can use to smoke it with and also a bong at the bottom. And also this is uh, what was sold as medicinal marijuana. So another tactic gangs are using is saying, oh no, this one's a lot safer and a lot better quality because it's medicinal. You know, it's, it's been approved by the government and everything. Um, it's, you know, you can get it from doctors and everything. Um, but what actually they've done is they bought the pots off Amazon and they printed the labels themselves and they've enabled them to stick an extra few quid on the price of selling it. But what people may think is that they actually have something that's safer and not sprayed with random chemicals in someone's attic. In terms of dealing equipment, um, I mean, the top is a bit extreme, but most uh, most will have some sort of small digital scale for weighing um, either cling film or these little plastic bags for putting the, the product in. Um, maybe a, a supply of Kinder Eggs um, and, and some Vaseline or something like that if, if they're internalizing, internalizing it. Multiple phones uh, and uh, potentially weapons as well. As I said, I'll send you all a copy of this so you can have a look. Any other questions, you can contact me afterwards or, or anything like that. Um, engaging with young people at risk. So you know, you now know what County Lines is, what, how it works um, and what signs to spot. What can you guys kind of do about it? What do you, what's in your arsenal as it were? So I'm going to take you through uh, just a few tips on engaging with young people about this topic. Uh, and then where you can go for help and then I will finally leave you. <laughs> so first of all if you're going to have this discussion with a young person the best thing to do is to prepare. You guys are already doing the right thing because you're here, you're getting that knowledge and that background information. Um, you have to remain calm and open, um, it's very you know you're very protective, you're very defensive and we know that's out of love and care um, but if you remain calm and open uh, through the conversation, make sure that it's not just a one off conversation. Make it clear that this is going to happen. I'm going to talk to you about this more often. Try and build that relationship and keep that honesty going. Try and stay calm. It's not going to you're not going to get the information you want or build that relationship uh, if that young person feels they, they can't speak to you without you kind of getting angry at them. Um, try and be as supportive as you can. As I said, prepare. So be aware of the different avenues you can go for help. Um, and also don't blame yourself. You, the, you know, the young person is not in this position or in any position because of something you've done. It might not even be because of something they've done. Um, so make sure that you uh, follow some of the, uh, the charities that are coming up next. I would ask you, do you have any tips to share? But I'm aware time is dragging on, so I'm gonna pop on. So who can help? Uh, send you a larger document as well after this but there are a variety of different places you can go for help um frank talk to frank is a fantastic website that has any information about any kind of drug you ever want to know what it is what it looks like the law around it what effects it has go there if you need anything um your school this college will have lots of uh, information, lots of, uh, they have a whole safeguarding team to answer any questions, provide you with support. I would say, you know, take your concerns straight to them. Also, you know, the police are there for you, as I said earlier, they recognise County Lines as part of that grooming exploitation uh, thing, and they want to help people. So they will be there for you too. And also your council, your council will have um, dedicated teams dealing with uh, exploitation, dealing with all sorts of stuff. So it's definitely worth getting in touch with them because the, you know most of those people just want to help as well, whether that's Surrey County Council or Hampshire Council. PACE is a fantastic place for you to get further information. Parents against sexual exploitation, but they're against all types of exploitation and have a huge chunk on county lines as well. They run brilliant forums where parents can share tips and also you can ring up and get advice from them. Uh, in terms of support for young people, there's the YMCA. I'm sure they do um, a lot of stuff in Hampshire as they do in Surrey. Uh, so not just kind of youth clubs, but also like therapy and diversion work. And Catch22 is also fantastic. They do lots of drug and uh, substance misuse services with young people. Then you have the NSPCC and Childline, and you can find lots more information on their websites as well. If you want more information about County Lines or any other type of uh, crime, um, we have a load more on our website, fearless.org, under the professional section at the top if you wanted to check it out. 
And just to solidify on that note of fearless, how important the information you give us is. Last year, 520,000 people contacted Crime Stoppers and Fearless, which is enough to fill in Wembley Stadium over five times. Out of those 520,000 people, we helped solve and prevent 27,000 crimes. Now, I can't tell you all of them um, because, frankly, we don't have enough time and also because of the anonymity. But I can tell you that we take thousands and thousands and thousands worth of pounds. <laughs> Lots of money was worth of drugs off of the streets every year, especially in Surrey and Hampshire. It's one of the biggest things we receive reports about. So thank you very much for your time. Apologies, it ran over slightly. Um, and uh, I'm glad that you'll be able to watch it all uh, and the bits everyone's missed uh, afterwards. Here are my contact details. Please follow us on social media for updates about regional, uh, regional things um, and also uh, things about Crime Stoppers and Fearless as well. If you've got any questions, drop me an email, give me a ring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. That, that was absolutely brilliant.